Good afternoon to our Japanese attendees and a good morning to those who are joining from Europe. I'm Yurita Rikomayor, country representative for Europe South Japan. A very warm welcome to our webinar titled Funded Startups, Japan and EU Perspectives. I would like to welcome our panelists. All of them will be introduced individually when their speaking slot opens. The main focus of this webinar is to highlight successful startup projects that have received public funding in Japan and the European Union. The event will introduce Japanese companies that received funding from the Japan Science and Technology Agency and capitalize on internalizing their assistance in their business operations and management. They will discuss how they have received success, they have achieved success, and what steps were taken, what steps were required, how each stage posed new challenges and what solutions were found to these. In addition, we will also hear from European company projects. They will be featured, similarly to their Japanese counterparts, to show how they received public funding via Horizon Europe and similar funding schemes from the European Innovation Council. And with this, I would like to ask the first speaker, Vice President Shigo Morimoto from the Japan Science and Technology Agency to deliver his opening remarks. Vice President, if you could please proceed. Okay, uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Morimoto Shigeo, Vice President of Japan Science and Technology, or JST. I oversee industrial academia collaboration, the international programs, and some other activities. First and foremost, I extend my gratitude to all of you for participating in our webinar today. I appreciate the opportunity to co-host this event with our partner, Your Access Japan, on this important event. This is a, just is a mission-oriented funding agency in Japan. As a part of our role, we are trying to promote R&D for addressing societal challenges and foster innovation through the application of science and technology. We support startups emerging from academia by enhancing their capability, and we hope to help facilitate their global expansion. Many startups are dedicated to tackling social and environmental issues, acting as a catalyst for economic growth by attract, attract, attracting investments and creating new value in the market. Government support plays an important role in helping those in impact-driven startups overcome initial challenges and scale up their operations and driving economic activities, foster positive social change and promote sustainable development. In this webinar, we will highlight government founded startups from Japan and Europe and connect them to various stakeholders. Today, I'm delighted to welcome two startups that have received the funding through JST's startup support program, Success, as well as other startups from Japan and Europe. We look forward to hearing about their past they have taken and their future. We are also honored two representatives from the European Innovation Council and the EU Japan Center joining us today. I believe this event presents a great opportunity for startups to gain insight on how they can expand their reach and even start building connections. Thank you once again, and I hope that you will find today's webinar informative and enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President uh, Morimoto for delivering your opening remarks. And um, let me just say that we are very grateful that we could organize this webinar 
with JST and with the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation and with the help of the European Innovation Council. Those of you who have joined today and who have been a little bit late, again, welcome to our webinar. And we are very grateful to our speakers who have joined and taken the time to prepare presentations. Next up is Kenta Take, who will talk about JSD and its success program from the Department of International Affairs at the Japan Science and Technology Agency with his colleague, Tomomasa Haraguchi, who is chief at Investment and Support Office for Startups, again from the Japan Science and Technology Agency. I would like to ask both of you to please deliver your speech. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I am Kenta Take from the Japan Science and Technology Agency, Department of International Affairs. I joined in JST in 2022, and I oversee coordination between JST and our counterparts in the Americas and Europe region. I am pleased to provide a brief overview of JST. And following my presentation, my colleague, Mr. Haraguchi, will introduce our success program designed to support startups emerging from academia. Now, I, I will give you a brief overview of JST. JST is Japan's mission-oriented funding agency. Our mission is to connect a wide range of stakeholders from academia and industry to generate real value for the global society. And let's start by understanding JST's position within Japan's STA framework. At the top, we have the Council for Science and Technology and Innovation, CSTI, operating under the Prime Minister and serving as the headquarters for Japan's STA policy. Below CST is the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, MEXT, and JST is one of the funding agencies located under the MEXT. And this slide uh, shows the other funding agencies under the next and our position in the whole STI system. On the right side, we have top-down funding agencies that primarily fund mission-oriented projects based on government policy and uh, strategy. JST collaborates with research institutions and industries to implement diverse projects, fostering innovation and contributing to uh, society's sustainable development. And this slide shows JST's uh, functions. Uh, more than 70% of our budget is allocated to uh, research funding, but we also have other functions such as information platform database services, public engagement, and R&D strategy planning. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, the types of funding programs that we offer in JST. As you can see, uh, from this slide, you can also see that uh, our main function is uh, research funding because there are a variety of funding programs that we offer. Our programs are categorized into mainly three parts. One is strategic basic research, aiming to create innovative technology seeds for strategic goals of Japanese government. And second one is industry and academia collaboration, fostering an environment for continuous innovation and commercialization in Japan. And third one is international collaboration program, promoting partnerships with countries and regions to strengthen Japan's capabilities and facilitate research and mobility. Among these programs, we will introduce our success program that is designed to support startups emerging from academia. Now, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Haraguchi. Thank you. Oh, hi, my name is Haraguchi from JST. I'm, in, uh, I'm from Investment and Support Office for Startups. Uh, I'm elaborating on the uh, success program. Uh, this is uh, the equity investment program. Uh, that means JST has uh, own shares of startups and gives them uh, capital support and business support for growing. And uh, success stands for, as a uh, little in the, this right, you can see, uh, sorry, you can see here. Here, uh, success stands for support program capital contribution to early stage companies. Uh, this is a, a brief overview. Uh, first objective, uh, this is a accelerate the commercialization of outcomes from GST's funding program. Uh, there are a lot of startups uh, using the technologies 
uh, stemming from GST's funding. Uh, for example, uh, we conducted the investigation how, how many GST startups there are. Uh, that shows about 800 startups exist uh, in Japan. So we are investing in such companies to accelerate the uh, commercialization of the technologies. And the, a second fund, funding budget, a uh, funding budget is 5 billion Japanese yen. Uh, that's approximately 36 million US dollars. Um, the, there, there, has a, there is a two eligibilities uh, to be funded. And the first is a core technology of the startup originates from JST grants, and the other is uh, the time constraint uh, that is before or within five years from incorporation. Uh, that means uh, early stage funding uh, is has eligibility to be funded. And uh, finally, we have investment cap. Ownership ratio must be under 50%. Uh, in other words, we don't hold the majority of the company. And uh, cash amount will be 500 million Japanese yen in total. Uh, but this is a legal upper limit. So in practical, uh, we usually hold a 5% to 10% by injecting uh, 50 million Japanese yen to startup. Uh, in practical. Uh, next. Oh, sorry. Uh, just like other private uh, investors like uh, CVCs or uh, venture capitals, uh, James, JST also aims to increase the equity values of startups. Uh, by giving them support such as personal and technical assistance. Uh, this is our portfolio. Uh, over uh, 45 start startups have been invested so far. Uh, most of our startups are conducting uh, their business uh, globally. As you can see in this slide, uh, Tokyo Bio and the core tissues and aquatic tissue and bioengineering are uh, giving you the presentations about uh, our session uh, after these sessions. Uh, please keep an eye on keep, please keep an eye on them. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you, you san for your presentation. We have heard about what kind of funding schemes GST offers to startups and those of you who would like to use their services please contact uh, Kenta Take or Tomomasa Haraguchi their email address will be made available upon request and next up we would like to welcome Maito Nakanishi who is CEO CSO and representative director of Tokiwa Bio and he will talk about introduction of SRV technology platform for safer gene and cell therapy. Nakanishi-san, if you could please deliver your talk and share your slides. Thank you for introductions. <clears throat> uh, uh, my name is Mahito Nakanishi. I'm CEO of CSO. I just uh, became the CEO last week. I want to introduce my our technology called SRV. This is a platform for safer gene cell therapies. I just briefly introduce our uh, companies. My company is residing in the Tsukuba Science City. It's about one hour uh, from Tokyo, capital in Japan. It's very close to the, uh, it is very convenient to say uh, This is the history of our companies. Uh, originally, uh, uh, my company was uh, started in the 2014s. Uh, this was supported by a start program of JST. Uh, after them, uh, and this company was based on the uh, patents of the AIST derived uh, technologies. So we are recognized as AIST startups. 
In 2017, we'll get a first financing, including success and others. Uh, after then, we are supported by Emil Japanese Government Agency for Medical and Research and Development. Gene therapy project and cell therapy project are started. In this first uh, <coughs> uh, investment, uh, uh, success is one of the uh, four investors in the class. So we uh, getting success is quite helpful to accelerate the other investment to join our companies. So thank you very much for our success program will uh, help us. So our um, technology called SRV, uh, this is a kind of the uh, recombinant virus uh, technologies. It's uh, like similar to virus structures, but the inside of these virus particles, the totally synthetic RNA molecules was incorporated. This RNA molecule is optimized for many various purposes and optimized for secure gene expression and stable gene expressions. So what we can do using these technologies? We can deliver genes to many kinds of animal cells and human cells. This way shows the expression of the green fluorescent proteins. You can see the cultural cell lines are delivered genes quite efficiently and express the EZP. Also, hematopoietic stem cells, that's a, a source of the, our blood cells, is also <coughs> can be uh, delivered the genes and express it. When this vector is <coughs> administered in the uh, blood tissues, local gene expression can be detected quite efficiently. Another more important <coughs> uh, characteristics of this system is they can induce a stable gene expression, but without affecting the human genome DNA. And there are three major <coughs> uh, approaches for stable gene expression. Stable gene expression is quite important, both in the cell therapy and gene therapy in the human medical applications. Range virus and AV vectors are two major tools for gene therapy currently. But both of them have some integration in the host chromosomes and got a, cause a genotoxicity that makes a mutation and cause a cancer cells. However, our technology Still, sound vector is completely different in principle. So, RNA based on technology is not integrated in the host chromosome, so it is not genotoxic. It is quite important for safer self therapy and gene therapies. Our pipeline, as uh, we have several pipelines. In our original pipelines, also a pipeline with uh, collaboration with uh, other company or academias. And this can be divided into cell therapy and gene therapy. In cell therapy, IPS generation is quite famous in our technologies. Also, recently, we can get a reversible cell immortalization. It is also very useful cell therapy uh, field. The pipeline, the collaboration with other companies or collaborations. Cancer therapy is a T cell discrimination, direct cell reprogramming to make the liver cells and the pancreatic cells, and the directing differentiation of the iPS cells. In the case of the gene therapy, we are targeting the hemophilia and the PKU, and recently microcardia passive as uh, uh, suggested by uh, academia collaborators. So I want to show you the, some of the uh, results of these uh, pipelines. One of the famous pipelines, the IPS generations. Uh, in our technology, SRB IPSC, we can get uh, nearly 100% conversion of human tissue cells to IPS cells. 
this is of course the champion uh, <clears throat> that in the uh, uh, champion tools in uh, all over the world. So <clears throat> you can see the hundred percent of the sales get the express the EGFP is converted to IPSC. Also by installing the other transcription factor genes, we can get the other type of the cell reprogramming. One of them is direct reprogramming. This is without IPSC generation, we can convert the blood cells to hepatocyte or tissue cells to pancreatic cells. This is done by with collaboration with academia and uh, near future we are try to in the clinical uh, investigations. Also another important area is a cancer therapy. One of the approaches in using the cell therapy is to take a, a recover the T cells. T cells is uh, attacking the cancer cells. So we are isolating the uh, T cells from cancer tissues. Then rejuvenate make the T cells younger and come back to a patient's bodies. These T cells are attacking the cancer cells very efficiently. So it is very one of the exciting areas. Another important thing is when the cancer has a unique uh, antigens, monoclonal uh, T cells attacking this uh, specific antigen was produced by uh, reprogramming the iPS cells. In this case, T cells, monoclonal T cells are made in a huge amount by using the iPSC terminations. In both of these approaches, our technology is quite, it was proved to quite uh, useful. So now we are uh, working with other people to making this technology in uh, our evidence. <clears throat> so, uh, this and our uh, uh, Yes, these are five years. We are working very hard to making the, uh, establishing the system to uh, making these vectors in a uh, clinical grade. So now we are fi finally we are succeed to the, make the protocols for uh, uh, SRP gen generations uh, and based on all these technologies. So the next stage we need to make a these vectors in the GMP grade. So we need uh, more money to uh, for <clears throat> making uh, these vectors for clinical application. So we appreciated uh, the new investment or support this uh, clinical grade vector productions. Finally, this is the building we are resident in the first for us. We are resident in these buildings for four years and they're working very hard and have all the, uh, 15 people working in these buildings. So um, we have welcome the new investment. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for delivering your presentation. Much appreciated. Uh, those of you who are interested in the project, please contact uh, Nakanishi-san by email. Again, his address is available upon request. We would like to invite the next presentation delivered via a video uh, recording by Hirobemi Saito, who is Professor Emeritus at JAXA, Nihon University, and affiliated with Synspective. The title of his presentation is Evolution from Small Radar Satellites to Mega Constellation at Very Low Earth Orbit. Thank you for your introduction. I am Hirobumi Saito, Emeritus Professor of JAXA. And when I worked at ISAS JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, I developed small radar satellite. And I got the James T. funding, actually from the cabinet office of Japanese government. And that funding was very useful to extend my work. So today I will present uh, my work and the uh, future plan. So the first page uh, it, uh, is a kind of the introduction and uh, the microwave radar can observe Earth's surface even at night and rainy days. 
that is the unique no, feature for the Earth's remote sensing, uh, unlike the optical image. So, and also, if we can launch many small radar satellites, we can see the, you know, the ground monitoring very frequently. So, not one big radar satellite, but many small sat radar satellites is more useful. And in the old SG, radar satellites have to be very large and costly. The left side is a German radar satellite, huge and big. But uh, due to recent small satellite technology, we can make small radar satellite. So we did using, using the money of Japan's, you know, uh, science, J JST funding, I'm sorry. <laughs> And the period is 2015 to 2018. And we got a 140 kilogram radar satellite with, you know, radar instrument. And the similar, you know, the trial was done in in Finland or Capella Company in United States. And uh, I started the basic research in 2013 and getting the GST funding from 2015 to 2018, uh, 18, roughly three or four years. And I have the uh, proto model of radar, small radar satellite. And fortunately, in 2018, a small startup company named Synspectrum found it. And actually, they launched the first demonstration satellite. And up to now, they have launched four radar satellites. And they try to get some you know, income for the data solution business. And this slide showed the some outline of our small radar satellite. And the only instrument is inside the satellite body, and the deployable radar antenna is on extended from the satellite body. And the, the inspective company uh, observed the Earth. So with one meter ground resolution using three radar satellites now. The below is one example of the radar image at near Tokyo. So they are now, you know, the you know operating or managing this small startup company. And this slide showed what we learned for this startup company. The first item is the respect to technology. That is firstly important, firstly important. And the private company have to get some money, but balance between business and technology is, you know, most important. And the second lesson learned is few managers from large company a uh, good manager for startup, but startup. We, we invite several managers from large company, but uh, only few manager is adequate for startup. And third item is the managers of startup company have to make a decision with the limited information. So, you know, the that somehow different situation of the conservative Japanese large company. So manager of a startup have to make a decision even with the limited information. That is somehow important issue. And we need to keep a long term dream in our mind. And uh, so we, now we are proposing the next step. Yeah. 
next step for the, this radar remote sensing. And uh, if we make the satellite, our satellite body flat, uh, you know, like uh, up, top to down, our satellite looks like a quasi two dimensional radar satellite. And recently, you know, the Elon Musk SpaceX launched to the 5,000 communication satellite in, you know, using the rocket. At that time, the quasi, you know, two dimensional satellite is very good to stack, stacking for the rocket ferry. So our radar satellite is quite good for adequate for this kind of mega constellation. And the second when we have a very flat radar satellite, then we can operate that one at a very low Earth orbit. And because uh, we can reduce the air drag, residual air drag. So the merit of the radar, the you know the when we operate the uh, radar satellite at the very low Earth orbit, the the received RF signal is become larger. The scaling is one over range cubic. So we easily we can get factor five or six if we reduce from the conventional five hundred fifty kilometer LE orbit to, to the three hundred and fifty kilometer or below. So the lower Earth orbit is very good for the radar observation. But uh, we need to thin orbit to a quasi 2D shape of the satellite. And uh, the similar idea was, was invented at the, you know, the United States Aerospace Corporation. They proposed the idea of disk sat idea, very flat disk type of satellite. That was in 2022. So now we jointly, you know, the working together with Aerospace Corporation to develop quasi 2D radar satellite. We call it SAR disk sat. So now, partially, we get the initial funding from the Japanese government and started the, we have started the development of this website to the radar satellite. Hopefully, for the first demonstration launch will be in 2027. The, our dream is Earth observation. The, with mega constellation for dual use of observation. That project will, will not be only a Japanese project, but also, you know, the America or some Western countries. That, so now we are moving from the small radar satellite to the mega constellation of dual use radar observation. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I would like to thank my colleague for playing the video and also thank uh, Professor Hirogumi Saito to have joined us via a video recording. Unfortunately, he could not be here, but welcomes uh, queries via email, which you can either send to him or to us as. Our next talk is by Chiaki Waki, who is president and CEO at Core Tissue Bioengineering INC. The presentation she's going to deliver is titled Game Changing Artificial Ligament for ACL Injury. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here either and will deliver her talk via a recording, which again, I would like to request my colleague to play. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Chia Kiwaki. I am a CEO of Quartish Bioengineering. We are developing Game Changing Artificial Ligament or ACL Injury. ACL injury is one of the most common injuries for athletes. It most commonly happens during sports that involves sudden stops, changes in direction, and jumping, such as football, soccer, skiing, and basketball. 
Once you are injured, it's more likely that you will be forced to leave from the team for at least eight months or forever. There are several data which tells that 35% of the athletes are not able to return to sports after ACL injury. They must give up their life as athletes. This is critical injury for people who do sports, but especially for the athletes. So how ACL injury is treated currently? The first time treatment is autograft, which is taking tissues from patients' own body, like hamstrings. However, some patients have lack of own tissue to treat due to rupture. So they have to give up to treat, complete their treatment. While some patients have multi ligament injuries and do not have enough tissues to cover the treat injury. If they do not have enough amount of their own tissue, they usually use allograft, which is a graft from human cadaver. Allograft has lower patient outcome than autograft. The graft area rate is 1.8 times higher, and the return to sports is two months longer. Also, allograft has higher risks of aseptic revision. To solve the issue of, of autograft and allograft, there are several kinds of synthetic graft made by carbon fiber, lacron, or polyester. However, the outcome was not as good. The rupture rate was 50%. There are other complications, such as edema or synovitis. Therefore, we need alternative devices to treat those patients. At Cottage Fire Engineering, we have developed a superior solution to these existing challenges. Our product is artificial ligament derived from deserialized hormone tendon. It regenerates ACL with a biological scaffold and eventually becomes a part of patient's knee after implantation. Our product will solve the issues of current treatment. First, we do not have to take patient tissues anymore once our product is available. Second, enough size to complete treatment, which is very important to have a better outcome. Third, a product will fit well in the existing hospital practice. Finally, a product is scalable. Let me explain how our technology will solve the issue. Our technology is to make artificial ligament from mobile tendon. When you hear mobile tendon, you may think, is it safe? Can we use it for human? Yes, we have technology called desterilization to remove cells which may cause inflammation and rejection. Once the white tendon is desterilized, the tissue will be sterilized as a medical device and implanted to patients' knee after implantation. After implantation, patients' own cell will be migrated from the surroundings and cell will regenerate ligament tissue with digesting implanted tissue. The ligament will eventually be regenerated and will be part of patient's knee. The device will replace current autograft or autograft. Here are technologies. Our first technology is desterilization technology, which efficiently removes cellular components of bovine tendon using microwave irradiation and pulse time flow. We use microwave heat to destroy cells and the pulse time flow to penetrate surfactant into capillaries to dissolve cell membranes. This is patented and held by both Waseda University and Quartish Engineering. Another core technology is freeze drying and sterilization technology. This freeze drives and sterilizes the desterilized mobile tendon after infiltrating the saccharide solution so that tissue structure is preserved and the strength of the tissue is maintained even after EO desterilization. This patent is held by Waseda University, but one tissue has exclusive license. We do have a list of animal and human studies to prove safety and efficacy. We have done rat study to prove desterilization and tendon integration abilities of desterilized tendons 
and this data will be is already published in scientific report. Also, we have done ship study to get POC, and we were able to prove the biocompatibility. We have just completed ship study, which we will be using for regulatory submission. We are currently conducting monkey study to prove immune response and safety, and we will have the result the first half of 2024. We plan to start first in human study in 2024 in Japan, and we'll have one month safety data in 2025, and one year follow-up data in 2026. This is global market size of ACL reconstruction cases. The market we are targeting is US and Japan, which is 773 million US dollars. This is the timeline. Currently, we are conducting sheep and monkey study to confirm safety of the product and moving to human study in 2024. We will have one year follow up data to receive review approval. We expect product launch in 2027 in Japan. We are also preparing to enter US market. We have done FDA pre submission in 2020 and planning to have another meeting with FDA to consult design of the clinical trial this year. We plan to launch product in 2028 in the United States. Here's our pipeline using quant technologies. Our second product will be artificial ligament for rotator cuff injury. And we are currently working with Japanese orthopedic surgeon to develop the product and planning to start animal study in 2024. Here is the key message. We are currently raising 5 million US dollars in Series B. We are also seeking sales distribution partners. Thank you very much. Since she could not be here in person, we welcome questions by email. All those who are present, you're welcome to ask them questions during the Q&A session. So I would like to ask you to submit your queries in the Q&A box. Please have a look. It's in the uh, it's integrated into the webinar panel right here at the bottom. Uh, type up your questions and uh, our speakers will answer them during the Q&A right after the presentations. So please mm -hmm. type them ahead of time so we can see them well in advance. And uh, we would like to welcome the next presenter who is from ASMEA EIC Accelerator. Marco Rubinato, Senior Project Advisor, and he will talk about the ERC Accelerator overview selection process and hints for a successful application. And with this, we start the European side of our webinar. Good morning. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry. Here yeah, this morning. Um, I, I shortened this presentation. Uh, a lot because it was um, bigger and uh, we don't have time for all of it. So just to tell that I, I I will send the complete presentation to Judith. Don't hesitate to ask her if you uh, if you want more information. I try to make it more um, adapt to the audience. So ESE accelerator ESE is composed by three funding schemes that are divided by according to the technology readiness level. For early technology level, we have Pathfinder. Then from three to six, we have transition. And from seven, uh, from six to nine, we have accelerator. And we will focus on this. Uh, and, and during this presentation, we will focus on this. There, is, there are already so many things to say about accelerator that I, I, we really don't have time to speak about Pathfinder and transition, but this may be another, another occasion, maybe. So, okay. Um, uh, so what he, what we are looking for? Uh, I'm sorry, this continued to appear as, as soon as I move the the bus. What are we are looking for? So we look for startup and SMEs ambitious that want to scale up a innovation uh, that can create a new market or disrupt existing one. So this has to be technological breakthroughs or uh, scientific discovery, and uh, this kind of in, of funding is needed for uh, a long time frame and usually are too risky for private investors alone. So this is the kind of project uh, and companies that we look for. Uh, 
So, oops. Uh, there are three different funding options, grant only, grant investment, and investment uh, investment only, accordingly to your specific needs and uh, status of the TRL. Uh, the grant component can be a maximum of two million and a half, and this two million and a half should have to cover the 70% of your needs. So you, you need to show us that you you can also uh, provide the 30% by your own uh, by your own uh, means. Uh, small and mid caps are not eligible for grant only, but only small and medium enterprises. For the investment component, it's uh, more, of course. We we provide up to 15 million euro, uh, usually in form of the equity or quasi equity, and we we use the patient capital principle. We, so we are a silent investor. Of course, we we have a minor ownership for um, a period, but we will also study a exit strategy because it's not our interest to be part of your capital. It's just to, of course, to check how public money are spent, but. Uh, together with, uh, as patient capital, we also st study the exit strategy together with you. So, but it's not only money what we provide, because we also provide access to advice with coaching, mentoring, and so on, access to business partners with corporate events, investors, uh, funding, um, uh, sorry, uh, venture capital, and so on. Um, but also access to innovation ecosystem and peers. We, we organize events. We allow you, we allow our beneficiary to participate to international trade fairs also out of Europe, and we train them how to pitch, how to, how to, to interact with a specific type of um, of public and so on. So it's really a lot more than just uh, for providing funding. Uh, who can apply is just for mono beneficiaries, SMEs with maximum 250 employees, but also natural person that are willing to set up an SME. Of course, I don't lie to you. It's more difficult for natural person because you really have to prove us that you have clear ideas on how you will set your business uh, and, uh, and your team. But still, it's still possible. So there are two kinds of funding scheme, the open and challenges. So open is for project in any field and challenges for only specific thematic areas. And so when it's challenges, you have more possibilities to be selected. I will tell you later the, the challenges. Uh, until now, we provided already over 10 billion euro um, for in follow on investment and 90% of funding are for women led companies. That is for us, it's a very sensible point because in the past we realized that the majority of our funding was not targeting women so we we do more and more effort to no effort but there are so i mean so many women ceo that deserve to be uh, founded so the, the novelties uh, okay first of all the new challenges are the artificial intelligence of course uh, quantum computing uh, virtual worlds and automated interaction, uh, food from fermentation and algae, uh, monoclonal antibody um, based therapies for imaging viruses, of course, after COVID, and their renewable energy sources and their whole value chain. So this is um, these are the six uh, the six topic that uh, will uh, assure you a faster um, uh, not faster. We give you more possibilities. Um, Okay, so I go faster because I see that I'm already at more than five minutes. So um, the next cutoff is in the 3rd of October 2024. We just passed that one. And um, so I should suggest you to target uh, the 3rd October if you are interested in applying, of course. Uh, as you can read here, uh, after three successful and successful submissions, you cannot apply again. So voila, better to postpone the application than to just apply for the sake of applying because it's uh, voila, better to ma maximize the possibility. Evaluation process, uh, okay, you have an idea, you, you tell us your idea, we consider it it's a good idea. So we help you to refine the proposal uh, with coaching. Then if you want to so submit the full proposal, you will be assessed uh, by the remote evaluator and that if they give a go, you will pitch in front of a jury. And then select if you select it, you will sign the contract, you will access to the pre financing 50% and then to all the, the, the services that I've listed earlier. Uh, this is the, the here are some useful link that you can check when uh, if you are interested. And so incentives, this is the part that is the most interesting usually when I give this kind of presentation, because before you apply, we have to take advice 
or not they're funded. These are all information that can be applied, not just for our funding scheme. That's why it's always useful. So first of all, you take advice on other funding programs to check if it, this is the right one for you. So you don't waste time, let's say, applying something that is not related to your needs. Uh, then identify your fundraising strategy, public, private, or a mix. Uh, you have to read carefully if your project fits with the objective um, of, or the the challenges and also access assess sorry if your project is eligible based on the technology readiness level but also on the financial aspect when when you are applying you have to cover all of each evaluation criteria so excellent impact and implementation uh, you have to write as if if you want to convince the the reader the, the jury member to invest in your innovation and also sometimes they are part of venture capital so maybe in the future they might, might even invest so that then you have to put updated realistic figure for example the market size your competitor is very important are very important the three-year projection because this not only help you to understand better the market doing this business plan but also help the, the jury member to understand that you really know what you're talking about and um, so you have to use also a catching title a good abstract because not all the jury members are technological expert in that field because we of course we all take the expert for example in uh, let's say in environmental topics but then some some they come from university and some from the business world so it's better to use appropriate keywords uh, the four matters so test um, your language test the, the proposal review the language and so on uh, and successful proposal sorry it's appearing again a successful proposal are um, are too much progress project focused and not on the opportunity um how can i i ah, voila here it is sorry i hide it again uh, okay uh, not in the opportunity there are no information on the team team is fundamental because you cannot handle a project alone there are not inf information on competing solution there are always competing solutions you have to show us that you know about it and um, and though the technology readiness level is not at the right no moment also pitching is important yes sorry pitching is important you have to pre to be able to present in a short timing your your uh, your idea your story your company and uh, in front of investors or in front of customers and so we help you also with this when but first you have to arrive to us with a, a good pitch i've almost finished sorry for the excessive timing um, and why you need to pitch because the customer don't care so much about technology they care about they want to solve their problem and they want to increase the value of their investment or their resources so you have to answer in the pitching how much it costs to the to the to the public to get what how they will spend their money how how much and when i will get back my money my investment so not because normally you pitch for money for uh, fundraising or to receive advices or to increase the networking of customer so some general advices last slide is keep in mind why you are pitching Keep in mind the audience, try to anticipate their question or adapt their pitch according if it's for friends, customers, pastors, and so on and so on. Try to increase your skills in speaking. You watch TED Talks, uh, uh, go to a coach, or just train by yourself and say, we will, not we think you have to have need to have a positive attitude. You, you have to convince, as I said. And uh, and start from the why. Keep it simple. Why slide for minute and one idea per slide. Voila! I should have keep it simple because I am at eleven minutes. Sorry for this. Uh, so I will be happy to reply to all your replies in the Q and A session. And then now I stop to share my screen. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. In the Q and A, as Marco said. They will answer any questions you may have. So use this opportunity and type up your question in the Q and A box. Now is the now is the time to do that. We are going to go ahead with the webinar and invite Jose Carrito, Chief Scientific Officer at Inbrain Neuroelectronics, who will talk about Inbrain from lab to fab. Jose, if you could please. Hi, good morning. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So good morning, everyone, um, to the Jap to the European colleagues and good afternoon to our uh, Japanese uh, colleagues. So I will be presenting in Brain Neural Electronics. Uh, in Brains, as you will see, is a, is a startup from, from Barcelona. Um, I'm a chief scientific officer of the, of the company, and I'm also a professor at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And in Brain decodes uh, neural signals 
uh, into breakthrough therapies uh, using graphene, as you will see. Um, so we are a company, has been mentioned before, at the intersection between med tech, uh, deep tech, and digital health. And what we use is uh, graphene uh, materials to decode these neural signals and convert them into breakthrough solutions. So the company was founded in 2020, uh, right before COVID. Um, at the moment, we are about 50 people. Um, and I will explain very briefly that we have divided into two, two companies. One is a subsidiary of the other. So far, we have been rising um, in total like at 23 million of euros, uh, including 6 million euros from non dilutive funding from the European Commission. We are very uh, uh, glad to the uh, support, uh, not only in terms of funding, but also in other ways from the Commission. So we have, um, as been mentioned before, we have uh, support from the Pathfinder for the transition and from the Accelerator. Um, we are at the end of Series A, as I will say throughout the end, and uh, we are raising 55 million in our Series B. The market that we are addressing, as you will see, it's a 25 billion euros. This is the neurology and bioelectronics uh, market. I would like to say that we are spin-off from the graphene flagship. This was a 10 years long uh, effort from the European Commission um, to support the uh, uh, transition of uh, graphene technologies from the lab uh, to commercial uh, no, stage. And uh, that uh, the technology that I'm going to present has been mature over these long years within the a graphene flagship, a European funded project, and then receive additional funding from the European Innovation, Innovation Council. So let me just quickly mention, uh, put you in context uh, of, of why graphene, why we're, I mean, why we need this type of uh, technology. Um, as you know, like a, almost one third uh, of uh, the population of our societies are have some sort of neurological disorder, of course, um, uh, are more acute than others. And most of these patients, uh, like I say, 30% of these patients are refractory to pharmacological treatments and they need uh, alternative uh, solutions. And this creates a, a tremendous burden uh, in our societies. An example, just in Europe or in the US, I can imagine that Japan will have similar impact. But Europe, Japan, in the, uh, sorry, Europe and, um, and US independently, they have almost like 800 billion cost. So we need to find alternative solutions for, for many of these patients. Unfortunately, the current um, um, solutions that we have, uh, what we are uh, discussing, like it's the bioelectronic therapies, they are not offering uh, to the patients what uh, they would like to see. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see how the um, high invasiveness, which is perceived by the patients, uh, results in a 50% rejection. Here in the center, you can see how the current technology, which is based on standard technology, like say metal electrodes, which are implanted deep in some regions in the brain, uh, for instance, in the case of Parkinson, the current technology is too bulky and does not provide sufficient specificity and therefore the outcome is not uh, what is needed. And um, um, their current technology is not really personalized for the for the patient use, and therefore uh, this has an impact on the adoption of all the technologies. So we believe that uh, with new technologies and with new materials, you can unlock the potential and uh, of all these uh, neuroelectronic therapies, and that's why uh, we have introduced graphene. We believe that graphene is a breakthrough in neurotechnology because of all the um, uh, properties that this material has. No, from our perspective, uh, what we are uh, aiming is like um, or graphene allow us to miniaturize the electronics uh, to miniaturize the device in a way that it will uh, have much lower invasiveness. The implants, so therefore we will broaden adoption. Our technology allows to both record and simulate from from the brain, in order to. Um, um, offer um, solutions that at the, at the moment they, they, are not, uh, they are not in the market. So we will have uh, personalized uh, therapies and we will also address not only the 
so-called uh, neurology market, uh, but also the brain-computer interfaces market. And finally, we put the patients at the center of, uh, of the therapy, and therefore we do not, uh, um, therefore we also consider signals from the patients uh, and the, the, his uh, lifestyle or her lifestyle and um, all the type of signals that would allow us to personalize the therapy uh, much more than uh, done so far. Um, so what we do, and uh, we decode neural signals from the brain uh, and convert them into medical solutions. So our first indication, which is shown here, is Parkinson's disease. Um, what we are implanting some electrons deep in the subthalamic nucleus, and then we record from the surface of the brain, and with both signals, we can tune and adapt uh, the activity of the patient such that we restore, like a, um, we remove the symptoms from from that from that patient. Similarly, we have epilepsy in our pipeline that will be second indication, and third indication in the future will be related to brain computer interfaces. The first one is be transferring like a, uh, for patients with speech impairments so or transferring thought into, into speech. Um, so just to very quick, uh, so that you see the technologies here on the left-hand side, you can see the traditional um, metal-based uh, electrodes, which are implanted either in the surface of the brain or deep in the brain. But here you can see that using thin foam technology um, modern semiconductor technologies and integrated within them graphene, we can increase, we can reduce the size of the of the devices and we can increase the number of electrodes that we can implant such that we can improve therapies. Uh, we have two product lines, the top one and the bottom that you can see in the in this slide. The top one is an acute device that will be used just for brain mapping. In this case, we have got uh, approval from the MHRA, which is a regulatory agency in the UK, where we are going to be doing the first patient. The first patient is in, imminent because all the paperwork has been done and we are already recruiting this patient. So we plan by 25, 26 to have com first commercialization. And the second product is um, uh, what we call the uh, intelligent neuromodulation system. It's a device that is going to be used for treating Parkinson's disease. We have got a, a, a breakthrough designation from the FDA, and we are planning our first in human uh, for the during the next uh, uh, three years uh, within series uh, within series B. One of the challenges for us was to transition from a re, uh, from a um, research environment into a more industrial environment, and we put a significant effort in that. So we have built a very um, strong uh, leadership, uh, uh, clinical uh, business and industrial team. As you can see people coming from different uh, uh, industries. I am the only academic person who remains in the, no, in the, in the environment. And of course, we have a very strong uh, clinical board uh, that is supporting us and helping us to design our, our technology. So at the moment, uh, we are uh, in closing our Series B. Um, we are uh, closing a Series B of 55 million, and we are space for an additional uh, uh, partner who would like to join uh, with a ticket of 5 to 10 million. I would like to mention that um, in addition to the, uh, the standard VCs, we also have, of course, the European Commission, and has been mentioned before, with a 50 million uh, ticket uh, in the frame of the, of the accelerator. And we also have other um, um, governmental funds like um, the um, um, European uh, debt. Uh, uh, we we got a debt uh, option from the from the European Investment Bank of of twenty million. Yeah. So with this um, funding, we will be able to uh, move on another three years, and we will be able to demonstrate uh, that uh, to bring into commercialization our cortical device and to demonstrate first in human the long-term uh, uh, device for um, Parkinson's disease. And with this, I would like to finish. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and it was a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much for um, your talk. And um, those of you who are here to look for academia industry transfer and how to actually um, initiate startups, it's um, a great opportunity to 
ask questions from Jose. So those of you who are interested in that might like to send him an email or post your queries either in the Q&A box or in the chat. I also see a question in the chat, so we'll be they will be answered later during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Our next presenter, I would like to welcome Eugenio Realini. He's CEO at GRED Grad, and uh, the talk he is going to deliver is titled Grant's R&D Projects for Satellite-Based Earth Observation. I would like to thank uh... Euraxis and uh, uh, JST and the EU Japan Center and the EIC for this opportunity. Uh, and thanks for the introduction, Judith. So let me briefly introduce GRED. Uh, GRED stands for Geomatics Research and Development. We are, we are an SME founded in 2012. We count now 10 people and we were founded as a spin-off of Politecnico di Milano University. As you can imagine from the name of the company, we are focused on research and development, uh, particularly in the field of geodesy and geomatic, and we deal mostly with GNSS data processing and gravity data processing. So by doing several uh, activities and projects in uh, of research and development, uh, of course, we need uh, funding, and, and typical, typically these funds came and still come from uh, the European Union through uh, the Horizon Framework and uh, through the European Space Agency. And from the, uh, this research and development, we take uh, the most pro promising um, developments to the technology readiness level nine in order to take them to the market. And this is what we did, for example, with our main service that is called GeoGuard. GeoGuard is an uh, operational monitoring service based on GNSS to monitor uh, critical infrastructure such as bridges, dams, and so on, and uh, land movements such as landslides. We are based in Italy, in the northern part of Italy. So, uh, as I said, GeoGuard deals with the displacement monitoring, so we can monitor displacements with millimeter level precision, for example, to detect uh, the formations of bridges and dams and so on. And the operational service of GeoGuard was actually kickstarted also uh, thanks to EU funding. In fact, we were granted on uh, what was called then Horizon 2020's May instrument phase one, which is uh, uh, nowadays uh, called the e, uh, EIC accelerator, as Marco was presenting earlier. And this allowed us to kickstart the operational activities with GeoGuard. But then new developments that we introduced later on in our service, uh, particularly those related to meteorology and reflectometry, which I will present briefly later on, uh, were actually enabled by these research and development activities uh, thanks to EU funding. So here is a list of the R&D projects, both past and ongoing, that we have uh, undertaken over the years, starting from roughly 2014. So we started with a small Eurostar project uh, at Vige, then uh, we had two projects funded by the European Space Agency, and it was, uh, let's say, a natural uh, start for uh, for us as a company because we used to work with the European Space Agency when we were in Politecnico di Milano University. So it was a natural continuation. And then we had our first, the opportunity to join a first uh, consortium in a Horizon 2020 project that was led by the uh, te Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands that was called Brigade. And that project in 2016, gave us the opportunity to see how Horizon projects were uh, structured, how the proposal was written, how uh, they were carried on. Since the uh, coordinator had a very large experience, we learned a lot for, uh, from them. And then we had the opportunity of uh, coordinating uh, our first Horizon 2020 project, starting from 2018, the GIMS project. And uh, this was our first uh, uh, Horizon project uh, coordinated by us, fully coordinated by us, and it was, uh, and it was what allowed us also to um, update what we were doing with the GeoGuard service. 
especially in terms of landslide monitoring. Then all the other projects that we have undertaken, you see here a list, uh, Twig, Ajada, Synoptica, Camaleo, Type RFG, they are a mix, as I said, of uh, projects funded by the EU and projects funded by the European Space Agency. They mostly deal with the uh, meteorology and reflectometry parts that we have added uh, later on to our GeoGuard service. So I will briefly present in this presentation some results obtained with the Twiga project, Synoptica, Hyper 5G, and Pembo and Magda. So when we talk about GSS meteorology, we are dealing about, we're talking about monitoring the amount of atmospheric water vapor to improve weather forecast. And in in terms of doing this, uh, we uh, had the opportunity of uh, uh, deploying one of the four first low-cost dual-frequency GNSS stations dedicated to such applications uh, near the Malpensa airport here in Italy in the Synoptica project. It was near the airport because the Synoptica project was focusing on enhancing e uh, extreme weather prediction for the sake of air traffic control. So we had the opportunity of deploying this first, I think among the first in the world, low-cost GSS stations dedicated to such application and to provide results in near real time to our project partners. Then again, in the field of GSS meteorology through the Twiga project that was focusing on enhancing Earth observation in Sub-Saharan Africa, we had the opportunity to deploy 12 low-cost GNSS stations in Uganda and Kenya, six in Uganda and six in Kenya, in collaboration with the, our uh, Alma Mater Politecnico di Milano. And as a follow-on of this Twiga project, basically, we are now involved in the Tembo project, which allowed us to, which is allowing us of, to provide uh, time series of near real time monitoring of the atmospheric water vapor to the Kenya Meteorological Department through the six low cost GNSS stations deployed in Kenya and one in Uganda. So the Tempo project is going on now and through these projects, we had the opportunity of uh, applying our uh, developments in Sub-Saharan Africa and networking with the potential stakeholders in Sub-Saharan Africa. Regarding GSS reflectometry, uh, here we are exploiting basically um, in, a, in an innov innovative way, uh, not just the normal, let's say, direct observations that we can get from GSS satellites, but we exploit the reflected signals of GSS satellites to monitor water levels and soil moisture, basically. So in this case, we are now involved in two projects, two Horizon Europe projects, uh, Tembo, as I mentioned, and Magda which we are coordinating, by the way. And in Tembo, we are applying G GNSS reflectometry, again, also in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we, have, we are deploying local stations nearby rivers and on dams in order to monitor water vapor, uh, sorry, the water levels from GNSS reflected signals. And in Magda, we are using the same uh, principle to monitor the soil moisture for the sake of enhancing agricultural operations uh, and optimizing irrigation, for example, in Europe. We have deployed stations in Romania, Italy, and France, and we are currently uh, monitoring and demonstrating the, the, the usefulness of this technology. Finally, uh, just a brief mention to the Hyper 5G project, which was just concluded uh, last week. It was a uh, project funded by the European Space Agency. And in this project, we have we had the possibility to collaborate with a Japanese company. They were not directly funded by the European Space Agency, but they provided, they were interested in what we were doing. And the project was about uh, hybridizing GNSS and 5G for precise positioning. And they provided us technological support. The, uh, the company is called Magellan Systems Japan. They provided us with the GNSS receiver, and this allowed us to do several experiments in the hybridization of GNSS and 5G. You can see here just some examples of kinematic paths surveyed by both GNSS and 5G. And again, this was one of the first examples of real 5G observations used for this purpose, I think, in the world. 
Finally, uh, we just uh, had uh, recently the good news of uh, having been awarded a Eureka Innowide uh, project uh, that is called uh, GART-J, that stands for GNSS for Urban Area Resilience and Di Diagnostics in Japan. And uh, we were quite happy to receive it. We were, ranking, uh, we were ranked uh, third in the overall call uh, worldwide. So we are quite uh, proud. And the project is starting in April. And this will allow us to expand our, uh, our activities in Japan. And thank you for your kind attention. And uh, domo arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I would have to say that your presentation tied in with so many of the, the previous ones and those still uh, pending in our webinar. Uh, we heard a presentation earlier on how JAXA um, basically collaborated with Synspective, and you also mentioned the European Space Agency. Uh, we also had academia industry collaboration, you've tied into that too, and uh, also the fact that uh, you have international projects, not only with Japan, but also with several other European countries, I think is um, a great uh, opportunity for our attendees to see how this actually works in practice, how it can be done. I would like to, again, ask our attendees to please post questions. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to have so many uh, of our high profile speakers together. And um, if you need any sort of advice or you would like to invest or you would like to ask questions, start a startup or get funding, reach out to our speakers today during the Q&A, again, via the chat or the Q&A panel. And with that, I would like to proceed with the next uh, presentation and ask CEO and co-founder Miroslav's brother is here with us today, uh, Tomas Rajnowski, and uh, he will introduce their project WIDMO, WIDMO Cities, Subsurface Scanning of Cities. Hi, I'm Tomas and I'm representing WIDMO. Uh, the problem currently the companies have is the information. That's the worldwide problem. And there's a lot of industry that depends on the sub subsurface information. For them, it's uh, quite a big problem because often they are limited to use um, information mainly from drillings, as the geophysics are often inca incapable to provide accurate information. They are the too expensive or they can't be used, especially it's common in urban environment where you don't have access to a lot of electromagnetic uh, methods. So it makes, especially for construction and mining, problem that it's, it's cost effective. It's not cost effective to drill everywhere. And especially that it provides you with a point information rather than have a, a full 3D view of what site is like. So for instance, if you don't hit the target and or the problems directly, you won't be able to see them, right? So you have to hit them with your drill to be able to tell uh, it's there. So it's uh, it's quite often an issue for um, for a lot of companies of you know how to speed up the process or how to limit their 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 dependency o o on the site. Um, we started in 2019 as a startup. Uh, obviously, being a European start deep tech startup, we were heavily funded by uh, both national and national and European. Uh, grant projects. So it allowed us to lower our cost of entry into very high cost R&D project. So it allowed us to find the investors who are willing to, to invest, especially it's very, very important for geographies that are not very uh, common for, for startups and high-tech companies. So it might not be an issue for for Dutch companies, but for companies from Poland, you know, being funded by by grants is is the way to be, to begin with, uh, and it allows us to find uh, investors, private investors. So we have a long history of uh, national and European grants. So we started with uh, it was actually Polish grant for um, for startups. So so they they provided I think eighty percent of. Uh, of investment and 20% had to come from private investors. So, so it was our first VC grant. And later on, we had a long collaboration, both in the Horizon and um, Horizon projects, especially um, recently, we have two ongoing projects, which one is uh, 
Um, Ficus projects is a uh, Horizon Europe framework projects. Actually, we have a colleagues from GRED here. We're on the same grant here. And uh, this grant are, allows us to cooperate with the, the best in technology in Europe, which is great. And it's strengthened a European um, in, in industry and uh, cooperation between the different companies. So SMEs are able to work with, with real top leaders in the field. And right now we have the EIC accelerator grant, uh, Vidmo Cities, which is uh, which actually began as a mistaken presentation, and it's directed for the, the development of technology for the cities. Right now we are raising Series A, um, which will begin somewhere beginning next year. Um, it's it's a great time for us as we enter the the markets. It's for scaling our operation, entering new markets, especially in Japan and South America and Canada. Canada. And uh, actually, we have already um, we are in the process of of uh, due diligence, but we have initial commitment from European Investment Bank, and this is another great opportunity for the companies like us to seek real uh, top investors and show them that it's um, an extra level of um, of support from European Union. Uh, so what we do is we actually develop to to create the to truly revolutionize the subsurface imagining, we develop both hardware and software. So we started with developing next generation ground penetrating radar that's based on the frequency continuous wave radar, frequency modulated continuous wave radar. And uh, our I'd like the proprietary software to develop and process the data. So what this allows us to do is we have a highly improved signal to noise ratio compared to current uh, GPRs, which are either pulse or step frequency radars. So this is allows to go much deeper at the, the same frequency, which, which translate to much higher resolution, but also to spectral imaging. So we, instead of having few, um, few frequencies, we sweep through the frequencies and we have a direct response from pretty much every, each of them. And so, so what we do right now, we, we say that we continue, we provide the continuous information within, within boreholes. So as I mentioned before, current companies are currently um, accustomed to use borehole information. And what we do is we continue information between them. We tell them where they have to look for the problems. We use the boreholes to calibrate. And from geophysical image, we go to the, to the geological image. So this is something that allows them to, to see the, their issues at, at the largest scale. Uh, right now we have uh, two radars, which is one is single antenna designed mainly for the cities and the shallow penetration double antenna radar that is specializing in mining for deeper penetration. And the, in the cities project with it based on EIC grant is allowing us to build the radar that is specially designed for the cities and is a uh, car based and, and so on. So, Technology-wise, as I mentioned before, the main competition for us is currently the, the, the normal GPRs, but we have a significant deeper penetration uh, in compared to the, to, the, to the normal ones. Um, and, but there are a lot of geophysical tools existing right now, and uh, we don't have to be fighting against them. We are complementary to some of them, and we can... In the, the, all of them can create some, can be used to create a, a full geophysical inversion model. Right now, we're working mainly in the construction industry uh, as well as mining and environmental. We've been successfully providing uh, services in mining damages, uh, which is seen here. So, for instance, we were able to detect a and um, where the sinkholes will appear, uh, connected with the existing mining tunnels. We are working in this landslide mapping, which is uh, quite common occurrence in in Poland as well. And uh, but right now, our key leg is on providing information for mining, providing information where the about the the, the whole. Um, the mine process, as well as the potential issues like like a fault line detection. Uh, for cities, we are developing three level of information, which is one is obviously utilities. Everyone is very interested in this part, but also much deeper underground infrastructure. We, we know, especially important in Japan, um, you know, and and 
any pretty much big city like Tokyo, New York or Singapore. And another third one, which is actually based on our knowledge and experience built on mining is the full geological model, which can help cities plan investments and response to the climate change and uh, and geological uh, and uh, geotechnical hazards. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm ready for questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is not the first that we've heard about radars in this uh, webinar. And um, those of you who would like to connect with this company and uh, help with uh, entering the Japanese market, I believe that uh, the EU Japan Center has the capabilities to assist you with that. I would like to welcome our next presenter via a video recording, Chaba Yonaki, CEO and co-founder and chairman of the board. Introducing e-chemicals is the title of this presentation, and I would like to ask my colleague to play the video. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Chaba Yonaki. I'm co-founder of e-chemicals, and it's my great pleasure to briefly introduce our company. Let me start uh, with our long-term uh, mission and vision. So our mission is to develop novel electrolyzer technologies, which can help the transition of the chemical industry from its current form to an environmentally sustainable one. To reach uh, this mission, uh, we have a vision how we are going to do this. On the long term, uh, we would like to become a leading electrolyzer technology provider, converting waste CO2 to valuable chemicals and fuels using green electricity. To reach this long-term goal, we have two other goals, a short-term one and a mid-term one. The short-term one being is having our operational prototype in a container ready uh, by the third quarter of this year and demonstrate its full capabilities by the end of the year. And on a mid-term, by the end of 2027, early 2028, is to have an operational pilot plant ready in a real industrial environment, converting carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. Why do we do this? What is the main problem we are trying to solve? We all know that uh, to achieve uh, the climate goals, the global climate goals uh, by 2050, the net zero, uh, we need uh, different technological solutions. There are easy ones, process and energy optimizations. We need more renewables, but still we'll have a certain amount of CO2 emission, which is actually quite a significant amount, which cannot be uh, decarbonized without breakthrough technologies. And carbon capture and utilization is one of these, uh, which handles CO2 not as a pollutant, but as a resource and builds a, a circular economy uh, using uh, carbon dioxide. And that's where we would like to play a key role uh, with our technology and our company. So where do we position ourselves uh, within this uh, CCU value chain? <clears throat> so the whole value chain starts with the CO2 uh, capture and renewable energy production. That's not us. Our technology starts when we have the captured CO2 available, we have electrical energy available, and that's where our technology comes into play. <clears throat> which converts the such captured carbon dioxide to different platform uh, chemicals, platform molecules, such as carbon monoxide and ethylene. These products can be further processed uh, to different uh, customer products, uh, steel, chemicals, fuels, plastics, but it's already out of the scope of our technology. So our, the boundary of our technology is handling the incoming uh, CO2 and converting it into uh, platform molecules. So why do we believe that our electrolyzer technology is the way forward? Uh, we have a fully patented stackable uh, electrolyzer design, which is very similar to fuel cells and PEM water electrolyzers. This is the design which allowed or enabled industrialization of these technologies, and we envision a future path also for CO2 electrolysis. Our design uh, was the first one allowing uh, record high uh, current density for the CO2 to CO conversion, which in turn results in both lower capital cost and operational cost. This is fully scalable. We have our already a 2500 square centimeter single cell design, which is stackable. We are the first one showing dynamic operation, <coughs> directly coupling this electrolyzer.
optimizer to the output uh, of a PV uh, module. And we will have also patented uh, regeneration activation protocol, which ensures long-term durability uh, for the system. And all these uh, factors basically feed in uh, to the total cost of ownership of the electro-generated CO, which depending on the input parameters like electricity price, CO2 saving, uh, cost uh, positions us either to the number one or number two position uh, based on uh, external analysis. As for the market, why uh, carbon monoxide production from CO2? We believe that this is attractive for multiple reasons. One is that there, there are many different sub markets for carbon monoxide, which are different in size and different in margin. So we, we are planning to start with the smaller scale markets where CO is used in specialty industries, electronics, R&D, food industry, pharma, all the way uh, to, to fine chemicals, then bulk chemicals, and then the sustainable aviation fuel market. So as the technology matures, we'll be able to provide it at gradually larger scales and gradually lower price uh, to compete even at these uh, lower margin, higher volume uh, markets. Consider the numbers of the carbon monoxide market. It's not easy to uh, judge or to evaluate because this is an intermediate product, which is often converted further uh, within uh, the same uh, technological unit. So the, the approach we followed when we analyzed the market was to analyze the market of the CO derived products and estimate the market growth based on these. We see that there will be a rapid growth from the market from the current about 100 million tons uh, CO per year all the way up to 600 million tons. The details are summarized in this article which we published recently uh, with our uh, collaborator. And we also projected how much uh, of this market will be captured by the renewable uh, green technologies. And we see that the low temperature electrolyzers uh, like ours will have an increasing share uh, up to 2050. This slide, uh, I present our uh, tech to market roadmap. Basically, we started to industrialize our technology uh, one and a half years ago in 2022, and now we are about having our containerized prototype uh, ready, which can treat 100 tons of CO2 per year. As a next step, we'll build uh, our pilot plant, uh, which will be able to treat uh, over a thousand tons of CO2 per year. And then the first uh, commercial, smaller scale commercial units will appear around 2030, 2032, uh, serving the uh, fine chemical market. Further down the road, we envision a similar growth uh, to what was witnessed for the hydrogen industry, having several uh, hundred megawatt uh, units uh, in place. So how we got uh, this, the initial activities uh, were basically funded uh, through different grants, uh, both national and, and uh, European Union based grants. And we also attracted seed funding uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, all these uh, sources cover our activities uh, for the containerized prototype development. And uh, early next year, uh, we'll conclude a Series A investment round, uh, which we start uh, working on uh, later this year. We have a diverse experience. So here I show uh, the three co-founders, uh, Richard Jones, uh, who is responsible uh, for the business development uh, aspects at a board level. Alexander Driver, uh, he's our financial strategist, and myself is focusing on uh, mainly uh, the technological developments. Our first line management uh, is based on uh, three uh, groups and three leaders, one head of engineering, head of operations, and head of uh, business development. We have an external uh, advisory board advising us from technological, business development, and financial uh, aspects. And with this, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Please uh, feel free to, to reach out uh, to us if you are interested in further details how to decarbonize uh, your industrial activities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the video contribution. Unfortunately, um, Chabayanaki could not be here for uh, the Q&A in person, but he welcomes questions via email, as he said. I would like to invite our speakers to come back on for the Q&A. And the first question that we had, 
How do government policies and regulations influence the startup scene in the EU and Japan? Are there strategies from the investor supporters, for example, JTC, ERC, that startups can use to navigate these challenges effectively? That's the first question. Anyone would care to answer? It's in the Q&A panel. My colleague, Haraguchi-san, uh, had to leave. So I, I want to uh, share this question with Haraguchi-san as well, but I'd like to share, um, uh, with as well as I know, I'd like to share my information. So the Japanese government, like in 2022, the Japanese government uh, announced its uh, five-year plan for the startup development. It is to, uh, in, um, uh, to to revitalize the startups in Japan with the goal to uh, create uh, about 100,000 startups in Japan. So I think uh, the wind is blowing for startups in Japan right now. And also um, because, uh, you know, the startups and uh, all those companies are centralized in Japan, in Japanese uh, big cities such as Tokyo and Osaka, uh, a lot of municipalities are now trying to uh, attract um, startups to the local government. So there are a lot of subsidies uh, that these municipalities are providing. So um, I think this problem is kind of unique to Japan. Uh, well, maybe in some other parts of the world. So this is uh, uh, the information that I give you now, but uh, I'd like to uh, share this question with uh, my colleague as well and get back to you by via email. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyone from um, the European side, or we should proceed with the next question. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead with the next query. Uh, it arrived via the chat. Let me just um, read it one second. Okay, question to Marco Rubinato. Uh, what opportunities are there for researchers stationed in Japan who plan to establish a company in the EU? Does the ERC apply to them? Do they need to relocate to the EU? Is it possible to have a Japan EU company kind of multinational, so to say? Marco? Uh, so the best case scenario would be for Japan to become an associated country. That would be perfect. Uh, otherwise, uh, yes, you should relocate to, to Europe because uh, the fundament, one of the fundamental, uh, let's say, condition is that the job created are in Europe, taxes are paid in Europe, and let's say the improvement of life, social condition, uh, impact Europe first. So, of course, no problem at all. If you relocate to, to Europe and you create a company as a Japanese, uh, no problem at all, absolutely, to uh, access to the to the funds. But again, all the conditions listed will, should be there. And again, as I said, if you have other questions later about the funding scheme, contact Judith and she will give you my personal email also. No problem. Thank you, Marco. The next question, um, from what I see in the recent extensive pitch contest, <clears throat> excuse me, of different kinds, many startups emerge with brilliant ideas and passion, but may have weak understanding of team roles, strengths, expertise needed to stay competitive and resilient in the market. What tools or resources can startups use to assess whether their team members have the necessary skills and capabilities to contribute effectively to the startup success. Again, this is via the Q&A uh, box. Um, would anyone venture an answer to that? Yes, go ahead, Thomas. Maybe I can answer. <clears throat> uh, in Europe, we have a lot of uh, acceleration programs, and it's not only in Europe, but worldwide. So, uh, so especially technical founders should apply to those accelerator programs. Often they are founded by European Union as well, and we we take part in a couple of those. Uh, so they are providing you with uh, with a mentoring and uh, business skills development, and they're like a great place to safely test the team, and. Uh, Go through with um, and then see potentially what 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 your team uh, lacks or uh, where where it, where this trend lies. Thank you for the answer. I hope that satisfies. Maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you maybe I can uh, I can jump in sure. and uh, and 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 also even if it's the end. Thank you, Luca. Uh, good morning. Yeah, Luca, good afternoon. 
Yeah. Um, sorry, you haven't been introduced yet. Um, Lucas Kofie will be our closing speaker. He is a, a manager at the EU Japan uh, Center for Industrial Collaboration. Luca, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. And also good morning and good afternoon to the uh, to the audience. So maybe to this question, uh, as if you are an entrepreneur starting, for example, a new uh, restaurant, it, it, of course, the importance would be location, location, location. In general, if you start a company, it's team, 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 always. So as Marco said earlier, uh, you have to be convincing. You have to stick to the timing. You have to be clear. It's always about how you deliver your ideas. And of course, if you're a winning horse, well, people will tend to believe that probably also your next venture will be successful. So in the case of uh, also where we had uh, incredible uh, stories today, uh, I know really well Eugenio and Gired. Uh, Eugenio with his company has been client of the center for several years. So I suggested uh, to you that, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to interview him, to have him on board for today, because I knew that he was a clear example of how uh, an SME should work also with grants, because he not just won, uh, had the chance to win uh, grants between uh, Europe and Japan, but also in Africa, as we saw, so also in other countries that are anyway related uh, to us. And actually at the center, we do have also a service that is facilitating connections between EU and Japanese partners in third countries. So indeed, also that is a case that is of our interest. Um, so yeah, to make the story short, again, uh, it is really important. The ways are multiple. You can study things online. There are tons of uh, videos, frankly, that you can see also from uh, uh, channels like YouTube and practice. That's the most important thing, like with everything else. I hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. Um, the last question that I see is, my startup core business is to, is to connect uh, EU problem with Japan needs in this way. As, foreign, as a foreigner living in Japan, is it possible to access funding through this program? And we have actually one more question. It was written in her, uh, my colleague's uh, presentation about success program. But the requirements for success program is that the companies must have received some kind of uh, grants uh, by GSD in the past. Um, those like uh, uh, national grants uh, from GSD themselves do not have any requirements for the nationality uh, as long as they are based in uh, Japanese institutions or universities. So for uh, the new, uh, for the companies that didn't, they have not received uh, grants in the past, there might be a limited uh, source of grants that GSD can provide. Uh, so because this is uh, what GSD is covering from basic research to the initial phase of application from academia. So uh, maybe uh, this uh, can be helped by other funding ag agencies such as NEDO, but uh, for that, I don't have much information. Uh, maybe with my colleague, I can get back to you about what kind of uh, grants or uh, or uh, support uh, can be provided uh, to to uh, to you. Yeah. Thank you for answering the question, uh, Kenta Take from GSD, and um, I hope that satisfies the uh, the questionnaire. The last, I, I think, uh, yes. If you if you can share uh, the emails of the those people who have asked questions, I, I we can get back to you. Yes, later. definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. And uh, apparently, the last question, but uh, we still hope for more. We still have a few minutes. Question for Marco Rubinato: Could you tell us something about the evaluation? I noticed a slide about the interview. Could you please explain it? Yes, of course, with pleasure. So the evaluation, uh, you can submit your short proposal whenever you want. Okay, this short proposal, just uh, uh, the pitching and uh, very short uh, indication of your project will be assessed by remote evaluation uh, evaluator. If they give you the green light, then you can pass, you should submit a business plan more detailed. And then this also will be assessed by three other experts. Okay, you can be assisted in, uh, in, in producing the business plan by our coaches, but also by the national contact points. So you are not left alone in this. 
Also, I want to say that even if you fail in this, uh, the business plan is something that remains with you. It will be useful for your uh, business in the future. So it's not, no, it's never time, time wasted. Okay, when uh, this, uh, we have three, uh, three experts assessing uh, remotely the business plan, if two of the three, uh, if the, the three give a go, then you pass to the interview. If two of the three give a go and there is a one no go, then there is the consensus meeting. So there is still the possibility to pass to the interviews. Okay, if you arrive to the interviews, then we, there will be uh, five experts expert in the field of your uh, innovation, but in different different compartment, let's say maybe it can be investor, it can be a potential customer, a university and so on. So they know your topic, but in the, in the different areas. So you, you have to be ready to reply uh, to their questions. So the, the interviews are, you do your pitch in 10 minutes, no interruption. After the 10 minutes, the five expert and eventually some representative from the European Investment Bank, if you have asked for equity or um, our program manager, they will ask you questions. So you will have 35 minutes of Q&A, very intense, to show that you know the uh, you know what you are going to do. And, uh, and, and again, to convince us to invest in your, uh, in your company. And if you pass this um, this interview, then there will be you receive all the, the instruction on how to do the next steps. And there is someone like me, one of my colleagues, that will assist you according to the topic, will assist you to, to have to go to the signature, receive the, the first pre-financing, and uh, and nothing, and go to the for all the steps until the, the end. Usually it's two years duration of the project, but Everything can be accommodated. Of course, we, we know that the business world is always evol evolving, so nothing can be foreseen, and not everything can be foreseen in advance. As they can, uh, look and Eugenio can, uh, sorry, and as Eugenio can see, can say clearly as a beneficiary. So um, nothing, and uh, of course, ah, uh, you can resubmit three times. Uh, you, so if you fail the first time, don't don't demotivate. Try again. It's possible. <laughs> I hope I, it, I have been clear. Thank you so much for answering the question. And uh, I do not see any more for the time being. Yes, thank you very much. It seems uh, that the yeah. person, yes? Sorry, Judith, can I add something? Yes, in the in the complete presentation that I've sent to, to the organizer, there is very detailed step-by-step -step of the evaluation. So I didn't show it here for a time constraint, but voila, you will have them, yeah. Yes, I will make sure that uh, uh, we post it on the portal and anyone can actually download uh, the file uh, from there. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the webinar chat or Q&A box. And as a matter of fact, it's perfect timing. We literally have five minutes left for the closing speech. It will be delivered by uh, Luca Escoffier, manager at the EU Japan Help Desk uh, and the Center for Industrial Cooperation. And uh, I would also like to say that this, again, I did say that at the beginning, this webinar has been co-organized uh, with JSD, the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation and EIC. And um, thank you very much, Luca, for all the help. Also, Ken Tatake and EIC colleagues. Luca, the floor is yours. Yes. Please deliver your Thank closing you. remarks, closing speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, again, uh, once again, thanks to all, all the speakers. Uh, we heard about a very interesting interesting pro and successful projects. We learned a lot about how to uh, to apply and uh, with a winning proposal and winning ideas. So we have definitely kind of a, set a benchmark. I would like to maybe tell you uh, a little bit about uh, the center, because maybe not all, all of you know uh, about the existence and what the center does. So the center is a quarter in Tokyo. We also have an office in Brussels, and our main goal is to assist uh, SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises, in uh, dealing with industrial cooperation, as the name of the center suggests. What, uh, what does that mean in, uh, in practice? We're trying to uh, do everything we can uh, with our resources to uh, allow entrepreneurs uh, 
uh, members of academia and research institutions and large corporates as well to uh, deal with each other, to share ideas, to connect, to work on pilot projects, R&D collaboration, licensing deals, uh, participate in missions, uh, attending fairs. Uh, so we do all the things that are needed to uh, enter the Japanese market if you're coming from the EU side and, of course, also do the opposite for Japanese companies. So, for example, and uh, also research institutions. <clears throat> so, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, I visited uh, a Japanese university, a Japanese university, and I asked them uh, to work together on a new plan to kind of uh, internationalize themselves in the sense that uh, we would have worked, we will be working on the creation of list of spin-offs that are ready to uh, enter the Euro, or they think they are ready to enter the EU market. Um, technologies that might be licensed out to potential EU licensees, and uh, and so forth. So it's a uh, it's a lot of work, uh, but it can definitely pay off. It takes time. We have, of course, uh, witnessed and we daily witness that. Uh, it it takes time with uh with collaboration uh, projects and with pilot projects and with distribution and sales agreements, uh, but once the uh, the deals are done, then the uh, collaboration that we faced and we witnessed between you and Japanese partners are very very solid. So I, I can definitely say that it's worth giving a try. As I briefly mentioned when I, I answered one of the questions earlier. We are also interested in partnerships that go beyond the EU-Japan dimension because we do know that <clears throat> a lot of projects between EU and Japanese partners also take place outside of these uh, geographies. So uh, projects that are, for example, taking place in Southeast Asia or in Africa or Latin America, those are of our interest as well. We do organize events as well that are addressing this, uh, these topics and they are facilitating and promoting collaboration and cooperation among the parties. So uh, what can I say uh, at the end of my uh, very short speech? I really encourage you, if you don't know me yet, if you don't know the center, please feel free to contact me or contact my colleagues in Brussels or in Tokyo. If you're an entrepreneur, you're interested in the Japanese market, you're an entrepreneur, you're interested in the EU market, please do contact us. Uh, all of our services are free of charge. So uh, I would say with an entrepreneurial mindset, it's a no, it's a, a no brainer, right? So uh, we, you should just uh, uh, give us a call, send us an email, and uh, I would be happy to guide you through the uh, kind of a wide spectrum of services that we can we can offer you to uh, try to be successful as an entrepreneur in uh, in another region. Um, the uh, I would also say that um, this is kind of a very practical and last minute information. I was running until now the technology transfer help desk uh, at the center, as uh, you did uh, mention earlier. This service will change its name, but not the core competencies. It will be called from April 1st Innovation and Technology Corporation to probably meter. Uh, even more the kind of activities that are going to be performed. And I also want to give you, if you're from the EU, uh, I, will, I want to tell you that probably we'll be running an innovation mission by the end of the year. Well, it will be published, of course, on the website and all our channels. So please uh, uh, stay tuned because you will be, uh, of course, receiving this kind of information. And if you are eligible with your uh, company, I really urge you to apply. And I really hope you uh, you can succeed and to see you in uh, in Tokyo by, by the end of the year. With that said, uh, again, I would like to thank uh, all the, uh, the speakers, Judith, for the great work that she's been always doing in organizing these events. She's a real pillar of EU Japan collaboration. We've been working uh, very hard on several projects. So uh, again, the biggest thanks go to you, Judith, for uh, your persistence and your strength. Thank you. Thank you so much for the closing remarks and the, the great um, uh, work that you have put in. Again, this webinar has been a collaboration with EU Japan Center, JST and ERC and EuroXI Japan is very proud to be uh, part of um, such collaboration. Thank you for the kind words. And with that, I would like to close our event. Spot on time. It rarely happens. It's one of those days. Uh, 
So thank you again for coming. I would like to express my gratitude to our speakers and to all the attendees. I would also like to invite you to follow us on X, Facebook, LinkedIn, Line. And we also have two portals, one in Japanese, one in English. The same goes for the EU Japan Center and JSD. They have information available in both languages. Thank you for coming. And with that, and goodbye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.